to uh, Revelation chapter 3, again, verse 14. <clears throat> I said in the back, I told some people today that I wanted to get through the sermon quicker than normal. My wife is away. The girls took her away. This was her birthday gift to go away with the girls, and her birthday's in April, but it happened that they could get together now, so they, they went away, and... Uh, so last night, you know, it's just me, so I made a, I got the big iron skillet out, and I did sliced up cabbage and onions and did a thing of noodles and made a great big iron skillet full of halushka. <laughs> That's lunch. Uh, so I'm leaning that way. I'll tell you right now, I'm leaning that way. That's one of my favorites, and uh, my wife don't like it, but I do, so when she's not away, I, I'm free to cook whatever I want, so... Uh, I'm really looking forward. I can picture it in my mind right now. Uh, and you know, some things when they're the second time, when they're heated back up, you know, like chili or halushka, it's better the second time than it is the first time. So anyhow, we'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, I got a spiritual meal for you right now. Uh, I want to look at something that God has laid on my heart. And let me say this next week. If you're, gonna, if you're part of the baptism if in, in the sense that you're going to be baptized here in November, I would, if you can, make sure you're here next week. I'm going to do a message on baptism and what it's all about. And I, and I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that. That saves me from pulling you in on another night through the week to be able to give you the same sermon. I'll just cast that across the church next week. So we'll get into that. But this week, God has, for a couple weeks, this has been laid on my heart to come back to Revelation and to look at this last letter, there are seven letters here to seven different churches. They are all applicable to our lives. They can be looked at in different ways. One of the ways, and we talked about this before, is that each of these churches, starting with Ephesus, Ephesus and, and ending with Laodicea, each one of them represents a season that the church is in throughout the church age. And of course, you come to Laodicea, that is the last church that is mentioned. So you can look at the Laodicean church, and I think you can pretty much figure out what the church is going to be like when the rapture happens. And, and if I could advance you a little bit uh, in the chapter 4, you can read it in your Bible or you can read it on the screen. Just to show you something here, to show you how it fits in the context, in 4, 1, and 2, John says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne that very well could be a picture of the rapture which falls right after the letter to the church of the Laodiceans which goes back to what I said that this church of the Laodiceans would be a picture of what the church would be like in the last days. I have talked to several pastors uh, over a period of time, and there is a major concern and discouragement. The discouragement comes from people that drift away, don't have a desire. They have no desire. There, there's no commitment for the Lord whatsoever. They have, a, they have a strong commitment for the things of the world, but they have very little commitment for the things of the Lord. The church is really not too important to them. They will drift in. They drift out. They're, it's fine. They don't think out ahead to think, you know what, this is so important that we have the church uh, and, and I need to do everything I can to make sure that this church stays in existence and this church is strong because if this church didn't exist, then where would I go? They, they don't think about that. And, and so I sense that even in situations here that it's the same way. And, and that would go back to what is in this letter that's kind of... Uh, 
I guess I could say a, a kind of a, a, a nationwide and, and even beyond that, a worldwide, uh, a worldwide thing that is occurring within the church today that there's just there's there's no there's no desire for commitment whenever we end up today i'm going to take you to the old testament and show you what we are supposed to look like i'll get to that uh, here in a little bit but you know the bible warns us over and over again to be very careful in the days in which we live in uh, first timothy 4 1 and 2 says this now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed watch this statement to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils or doctrines of demons this is church people these are these are people he's writing to timothy who was a pastor and 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 these are people that are in the church watch what they're doing speaking lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron okay there's so many things that we could i could do a sermon just on those two verses uh real easily but I, but i'll just hit the high points here if I could. First of all, if you notice on the screen, I underlined the bolded the words in the latter times. So that's the day and age in which we live in. The frightening part comes there in verse 1 about the seducing spirits. There are seducing spirits active today that will do everything they can to convince you that you can't get involved for the Lord, but instead you can just go ahead and live it up for the world to pull you away from where you need to be. He goes on to say that these people will have their conscience seared with a, with a hot iron. In other words, they will become desensitized. Have you noticed how much that's happening desensitized to sin desensitized to the things that that god says are an abomination they don't even bother people anymore no there's just that that becoming so used to what goes on that it just becomes uh we accept it as uh instead of standing against it we accept it as being a part of society and and kind of with the attitude well i can't really do anything about it anyhow and i say sure we can we can keep it out of our houses we can keep it out of our families we can't you can't change the world you're not gonna you're not gonna go change the world but you can certainly do everything you can to protect your family but a lot of people have not they don't see that and they don't they don't see it till it's too late until there is something that goes on that gets in and and it gets on the inside and one of the family members gets involved in something and one of the kids goes astray somewhere and and then they see it but then it's too late it's too late because it's already it's already crept in uh, this letter today uh, is going to help us to understand about things that we need to guard against what was going on in the uh the church of uh at laodicea the first thing that we're going to see we're going to see the way that the lord identifies himself as we come to this letter and he's going to do that in three ways watch verse 14 if you would it says and unto the angel of the church of the laodiceans write these things saith the amen there's the first one the faithful and true witness there's the second one the beginning of the creation of god there is the third one let, let, i just want to comment on those real quick he's going to do an evaluation he's going to do an assessment of this church when you go to verse 15 but before he goes to that evaluation to that assessment he identifies himself as first of all the amen and that means the one that is certain so what, basically what he's saying is the assessment that i am going to give the evaluation that i am going to give is absolutely certain absolutely spot on of of this assessment the next one is the faithful and true witness and and i from that i gather this that he's able to look at the heart he's able to see within the hearts of the individuals and so because he can see within the hearts of the individuals he sees beyond the outward facade 
and he knows what their heart is like. And let me remind you of this, that when he looks at you and I, he sees beyond the facade. We can pretend to be so many different things, but the bottom line is he sees beyond that, and he sees into our hearts. Just a couple reminders. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Psalm 44, 21. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Look, you can keep things from people, but you can't keep it from God. He knows, he sees, he, he knows the heart. Acts 15, 8 says this. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And then Romans 2, 16 says, in that, in that day, in the day, speaking of the judgment day, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So whenever he looks at this church, He's describing what he sees within the hearts. If you and I were to walk in there, if that church still existed and we were to walk in there, you wouldn't see the things that he reveals. They would not be made aware to you uh, until after maybe you had been there and had fellowship with the people for a while. Then maybe these things would have surfaced and you would start to recognize that. But on the outside, you wouldn't get it. You would look on the inside, you would look from the outside in and think, well, these people got it all together. They're doing absolutely just fine. The, 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 the truth is, no, they are not. No, they are not. This church gets no uh, commendation. They are not commended for anything whatsoever they are condemned but they are they are not commended for anything he also identifies himself as the beginning of the creation of god the creator the one that is sovereign over supreme ruler over creation and and in my life what i gain from that is this that the one that gives the evaluation is gonna is also the one that is the judge Something we talked about a while back. I just want to refresh your memory on this. John 5, 22 and 27 say this. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Let, let me explain something to you. And, and if you remember back whenever I brought that up before, uh, it'll, it'll be uh, just a reminder to you. But Jesus Christ will be the one that we stand before at the judgment seat of Christ. At the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, he will be the one that the unsaved world will stand before. Now, mark this down. You will be judged, the final judgment, you will be judged by a human being. Did you get that? by Christ he took upon a human body and whenever we stand before him he will be in a human body glorified human body you will be judged by a human being the father judgeth no man but he committed all judgment unto the son why because of this reason if we were judged only by the father then we could people would look at God and they would say well God you don't understand what it was like to live on the earth you don't understand what it was like to deal with temptation you don't understand to, to know what you don't understand what it was like to deal with the people that were against me you will not be able to say that to Christ because he already lived it he became Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says he became perfect in, and, and through his sufferings, meaning perfect in experience. So we're going to stand before a human being, and that therefore you won't be able to say, but you don't know what it was like. You don't know the feeling. Oh, yes, he did. And yes, he does. He, knew exa he knows exactly what we go through because he lived here for 33 years. He experienced pressure. He experienced temptation. He experienced pain. He experienced uh, the, 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 the fear of going to the cross because of knowing what was ahead. He experienced rejection. He experienced all of those things. So whenever we stand before him, there will be no excuses. There will be no excuses. Because he will say, yeah, well, I was a man also. 
And I didn't fail at any of those. So we will have absolutely no excuse whenever we stand before him. So that's the way he identifies himself as the one that is, that is certain. What he says is going to be the, 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 the absolute truth about this church. He's the faithful and the true witness because he can see within the heart and he's the beginning of the creation of God. He's sovereign over the, the creation, and he's going to be the one that is going to judge all of creation. And so, therefore, he's the one that we will stand before. And so that's how he identifies himself. Then we go on to the next point, which is the assessment. Watch, if you would, 15 and 16. He says, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Stop right there. Those that lived at Laodicea would have understood this language right away. And I'm going to tell you why. They, didn't have a, they did not have their own water supply. They had to use aqueducts to run their to pipe their water in from about 10 miles away in a in north of there in a place called Hierapolis so the water got piped into these aqueducts and if you were to look go, go back and 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 you were to look in history books you'll find pictures there's some of those aqueducts that are that still exist pieces and parts of them along with all the sediment in the bottom that had settled in but here was what happened because the water had to travel all that distance in the aqueducts, by the time it arrived at, at Laodicea, the water wasn't cold and it wasn't hot. It was lukewarm. It was lukewarm. In other words, whenever it got there, it really, in the state that it was in, it wasn't good for anything. Cold water would uh, quench your thirst Hot water would, could be used to cleanse things, but this, was, this would be lukewarm water whenever it got there. And you can only imagine what it would be like if, if, if your throat was parched and you were extremely thirsty, and, and so you, gr you gra grabbed a cup and, and, and you dipped in and you wanted just a nice cold drink of water, and whenever you dipped in, the water was lukewarm. Spit it right back out. That's the idea. Watch 15 and 16 again. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The idea is there that, that lukewarm water is basically of no use. And so what he's saying to this church is this. He said, that's your condition. That is your condition. You aren't cold, you aren't hot. You're lukewarm. I can't accomplish anything through you for that very reason. You are spiritually, spiritually speaking, there's nothing to be accomplished through you. You're just going through the motions. And so therefore right at this point in the condition that you were in you were just about worthless just about worthless that's where they were and i'm reminded of this that i that's the that's the church of the last days that's the church of the last days so there are a lot of believers today they are exactly in the same place i'll get to that more in a moment but that whole deal with them not having their own water supply was something that became a major problem in that city. And because of that, they did a lot of compromising. And let me tell you why. Because that water system, those aqueducts were out in the open. So if, a, if an enemy wanted to come in and they wanted to overtake that city, all they had to do was they had to cut off the water supply. And so because those aqueducts were exposed, the city did a lot of compromising whenever it came to the dealing with enemies. They did a lot of compromising. Kind of hard for them to take a stand whenever they're worried about whether the water is going to continue or not. 
very difficult for them to take a stand, and that's where they came. And I just want to remind you of this. That happens to a lot of believers today, that they won't stand up. They will not take a stand for the Lord. They won't, they won't plant their feet firm because they're afraid of the cost of planting their feet. They're afraid of the cost of taking a stand. That's where this church was. That's a picture of the church today. And, 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 and let me just say this, just an overall statement. Look at the churches that have compromised and, and they have accepted the, uh, the gay lifestyle, even put uh, homosexuals in a position of leadership within the churches not just to accept it but also to promote it they have done that because they're afraid of the what the consequences of the stand that if they take a stand against this then what is going to happen to our church where are we going to be in this church and they won't they won't take a stand and so therefore they have compromised same thing right here same thing exactly the same thing let me say this one thing there are multiple things needed in the church today in the body of christ not inside the building uh, there there are multiple things that are needed one of the things that are needed is toughness spiritual toughness i was listening uh this past week and i would highly recommend this uh, if if you did not hear it, but Dr. James Dobson on Family Talk did a two-part, it might have been last week, I don't remember when it was, two-part message he preached in 1983 on spiritual toughness and the need for it. And he said, basically said this, in our, in our nation, we have become wimps spiritual wimps because people are afraid to stand up for anything and we complain about everything that comes down the road boy this didn't go well today that didn't go well today and we do nothing but complain he told a story he told a story about a man that was confined to his apartment and all the guy could do was walk over to the window and look out, stand and look out. He couldn't, he wasn't able to go outside the apartment. And so he got to know the guy and, and he said to the guy, you know, I'm very sorry. And the guy said, oh, it's, it's okay, I'm all right. He said, there are people that cannot walk to the window and look out like I do. He said, so it's okay, it's all right. And, and he said, he, gave, he, he went on to talk about the guy, and he said about one time after Christmas, he said, I asked one of the most ridiculous questions ever. He said, I looked at the guy, and I said, how was your Christmas? He didn't have any family. There, there was nobody to come in. And he said, I should have never asked the question, but he said, he looked at me, and he said, it was really good. It was really good. No complaints about where he was at whatsoever just accepted where he was and made the best of it boy you know years ago let me say this when i was in construction work there were years whenever god was working in my life and and i and i wanted out i wanted out because i knew that god had something more for me and i wanted out and and, and, it, and it, i was I wasn't trying, I wasn't hurrying the whole situation along, but, but I made myself kind of miserable because I really didn't want to be where I was at. And then, then it came to me. Somebody said something, I don't remember who it was, I don't remember what it was. But the statement was something like this. Be the best you can be right where you're at and accept that as where God wants you to be. When I got a hold of that in my life, it was actually a pleasure to go to work because I realized that, you know what, I'm where God wants me to be right now. I am there. I don't, what do I, you know, why should I complain? This is where he's put me. And so it changed my entire attitude and it, and it got to the point where challenges in my life were welcomed. I, I loved the challenge at work. Before, I used to, I didn't like difficult circumstances and places, and, but it got to the place where I, I, I loved challenges, and, and, and it was just completely different. 
And today, we have, we have churches full of people that have no spiritual toughness. Remember the night Jesus was asleep in the boat and, the, and they got in a storm and the disciples were on the ship and, and that's just a fishing boat. We're not talking about a crew. We're not talking about a cruise ship. And they're on there and the storm hits and they're afraid they're going to die and they wake him up and, and I'm paraphrasing and they say, you know what, if you don't wake up, we're going to perish here. And he got up and he rebuked them. Because they didn't have enough faith. What would he say to us in the circumstances that we face? We want to complain every time there's something that is little that goes wrong and, 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 and we don't have any spiritual toughness. And so what happens is that we want to take the path of least resistance, just like this church right here. Give me the easy path. I'll go down the easy path. I'm not, I don't want that path where all that resistance is and, and where, I'm, where it's, life is going to be difficult. I don't want that, but it's God's will. I don't care. I don't want it. Because I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And so we have no spiritual toughness. We have none. That is why, let me say this, that's why a lot of men won't get involved in a church for God because they don't want to deal with matters. Thou say it straight up. That's what it is. And so what has happened over time, and a lot of churches not here, praise the Lord, women have stepped in because the men won't stand up. And the women have stepped into positions where they should not even be in because the men have no backbone to be able to stand up and to deal with matters. And they're afraid of confrontation. They're afraid of dealing with people. Listen, I don't like confrontation either. And I don't like dealing with sin and, and, and if it comes in. I don't like that, but it's got to be done. We got to be spiritually tough is what we have to be these people were not they had compromised they had compromised remember what peter said in uh first peter 4 12 through 14 he said beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you you know they're being persecuted for their faith uh wrongly uh falsely accused of burning rome and now everybody's turned on them, and now some of them are being burned alive. And Peter says, don't think that's strange. That's to be expected. That's to be expected as a believer that there's going to be resistance, that there's going to be opposition. These people didn't have it. I'll get to that in a little bit more. Let me read the rest of this. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice... Inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory, of, spirit of, the glo of glory and of God resteth upon you, and, there, and their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So the bottom line is this. This church was lukewarm. They were lukewarm. Watch uh, verse 17. Watch this. This will open up a whole new picture for you too about this church. It says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Stop right there. This city was extremely wealthy. There was an earthquake that destroyed much of the city and they refused any kind of help from the from the roman government to rebuild that city they said thanks but no thanks we'll take care of rebuilding our own city there were three reasons why they had a lot of financial wealth number one the, the city was located on a uh, a uh, highly traveled uh trade route uh that brought a lot of people through the city number two uh the city was no, well known for banking and it was a money changing center that even minted its own coins and number three it was the city that manufactured expensive goods they had a special uh be, I, I don't know what this would be but they had a they had sheep that produced a glossy black wool that was super soft and so they produced that wool that became very very expensive 
and many people wanted that wool. They also had a medical center uh, in the medical school there where they developed an eye salve that actually extended out worldwide to, to help with uh, people that were having problems with their eyes. So they had wealth. That's what he's saying here in verse 17. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. He said, we don't need anything. We have the wealth. We've, we've got all of this wealth. And that became their focus. Let, let me tell you something. We live in a very prosperous time right now. We do. We live in a prosperous time. I, I talk to, uh, to missionaries uh, over the pond, and, and I hear of things that they deal with. You know, when's the last time? L let me just say this. When's the last time you had to worry about whether there was going to be something there for you to eat? You probably never had to worry about that. I just told you what's waiting for me on the way home. Somebody broke in and stole that halushka. I'm going to be mad. <laughs> they can have anything else, but don't take that skillet of halushka. But, you know, we've got it all, don't you? You've got it. You wouldn't even, if you're like we are, I, I probably could do without going, I wouldn't like it, going to the, to the market. I probably wouldn't have to go. I could not go for a month and I could still survive. I got water to drink. I could, we could do things out of the freezer and, and, and uh, we would make it. So we are very prosperous. That has become a curse. I'm telling you, it has become a curse. Because what it's done is it has made us extremely soft. Extremely soft. And, and just like this church, that's why I say this is a reflection of our day. We say, well, we're rich and, and we're increased with goods, you know. We got all of these things, you know. You want to you wanna go away for a weekend, you got this to enjoy, you got that to enjoy. You, you can, you, you, you've just got everything and you can drive here and you can enjoy that. And, and so we basically say, really, we're not in need of anything. But yet we still go after stuff, don't we? We still go after stuff. We're never content with what we have in this life but watch how jesus evaluates them watch that verse again because thou sayest i am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not there's the frightening part they didn't even know what was coming they didn't even know what their true state was knowest not that thou art wretched okay uh, let me give you that that means afflicted they were afflicted within, within inside of them. And, and I, I'll, I'll use that and, and kind of take it to Lot. Remember when Lot lived in Sodom? Lot was a believer, by the way. Lot lived in Sodom, and the Bible tells us that he vexed his righteous soul. That means he troubled. He, he was afflicted in his soul. That's where these people were. They were afflicted. They were wretched According to that verse, they were, they were wretched and miserable. That means uh, pitiful because they didn't know where they were at. They didn't even know. They thought they were enjoying life. They'd had no idea what real life was because they were tangled up in the world. They were tangled up in the world. He goes on to say, not only are you wretched and miserable, but you're poor. They were spiritually bankrupt. They were spiritually bankrupt. They, uh, let me go to the next one, then, then I'll get to that. And, and, and blind and naked, completely unaware of their true condition. Spiritually bankrupt. They, they had nothing. They weren't serving the Lord. They, weren't, they, they were not involved for God whatsoever. They're just going about living for the world, living for the travelers coming through on that trade route and selling their wool and selling their eye salve and just rolling around in the riches, rolling around in the riches. I'm telling you, listen, I know this. We need finances to be able to make ends meet. We, we do. But I am convinced of this. Too much, too much will cause anybody to go in a different direction. It takes a strong individual to be able to have a lot of finances and still remain true to the Lord. 
It takes a strong individual to be able to do that. And I commend anybody that can do that. You know, uh, just like this church, people today, a lot of the majority of the people today in church are all tangled up in stuff, all tangled up in stuff. They thought they were fine. They thought they were fine. That's what they said in verse 17. They say they're rich. They say they're increased with goods. They say we don't have need of anything. Jesus said, oh, yeah. He said, I, listen, I am the faithful and true witness. I can see into the heart. And he says, I know this. You're wretched and miserable. You are poor. You are blind and you are naked. You might have this glossy wool and you might have this eye salve that takes care of the eyes, but spiritually speaking, you are naked and, and you, are, you are blinded and you can't even see. You can't even see what's going on. Let me tell you something else that's not in the text, but speaks so loudly. There's no persecution here. When you read this letter, there is, there, there's no persecution. You say, well, does that, does that say anything? It does. Let me tell you why. In that city, it was found out through a census that had been uncovered that there were somewhere between ten and 20,000 Jews in that city. Now, if, you were, if you've tuned in to our ACT study you know the attitude of the Jews toward the church and towards Jesus Christ. They, the early church was despised by the Jews. That's where the persecution came from, from the Jews. Watch them. L let me back you up a little bit. Y you can look there in your Bible if you want, or you can look on your paper on the screen. But Revelation 2, the church of Smyrna, watch what's said about them. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, okay, and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall, shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That church was persecuted. Why? Because they were serving the Lord. Watch uh, chapter 3, 7 through 10, right before this church. Uh, you have the church of Philadelphia says this, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Let me stop right there. You don't see any open door in front of these people. Because I'm convinced of this, that in order to see open doors, you've got to step through what is in front of you. This church wasn't stepping through any door except if it was the door going into the bank to put their money in the bank and to deposit their money. That's the only door that they are going through. That's it. Let me go back here again. Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So there was another church that was in going through persecution as well. So, but you come to the church of Laodicea and the silence screams at us. There's no persecution. Why? Because they're not doing anything. They're not sharing their faith. They're not, they're not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not doing anything like that. The prosperity silenced them. We're too busy. We're too wrapped up. And you don't want to offend somebody because if you offend somebody in the business, then they might not come back and they might not buy our wool or they might not buy our ISAV. And, and so I might lose money. And so therefore, I'm not going to say anything. And they fell right into the plan of Satan, right into it. And now there's no mention of persecution. And history tells us that there was 
thousands upon thousands of Jews in a city which should have been persecuting the church, but they weren't persecuting the church because this church blended right in with everybody else. No thing shared whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing. You tell me. You tell me this is not a mirror image of what is going on today. And I don't know where you are in your life, but let me ask you this question. What about you? What about you? Where are you at in the midst of all of this? Where are you at? Let, let me go now. Uh, I'll come back to that. Let me go to the remedy. If I could, watch verse 18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Let me go back to the beginning of that verse. Watch it again. I counsel thee to buy of me. Okay, so he gives the assessment. Now you have the remedy. So if you want to turn this around, he says, you got to buy. There's, and and when I buy, with that word buy, it helps me to know that there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a cost. In other words, if you want to turn this around and you want to live from me, then there will be a cost for you because there are things that you're going to have to give up. And what they needed to realize was this, that they could not keep going the way they were because they were lukewarm. They, they needed to turn this around. They needed to change it. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 24 and 25. He said, For no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and desire, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life and what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body than raiment? I, I included that, verse 25, for this reason. Because those two things were concern back then. Food, food for life and clothing to wear. Those were two things that were a concern not like we like not like we have today like i said your your refrigerator your freezer is probably full and probably your closet is full with things that you've not worn for a long time uh that have shrunk while they hung in the closet i know what they do i don't know what's in there but something in there shrinks them all up Shoes that you got, some people got them just piled up. I, I don't know. You're probably somebody's right here now, probably thinking he's looking in our windows. No, I'm not. I just know what human beings are like, and I'm one of them. And I know things that you gather that we don't. These things aren't concerns for us. They were for them. They were for them. But going back to verse 24, Jesus said, "You can't serve two masters." You can't live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. You, you can't do that and please God. You can do it, but you're not going to please God. And, and you are going to be, I'll take you back to that word uh, again, that where, where Jesus said that, uh, that they were uh, afflicted. That's what you'll be. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be content because you're trying to live for both. And you cannot do it. That's a, Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Watch what they were counseled to buy. Number one was gold. Watch verse 18. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. I think that is a reference to their faith. Remember what I told you? They did a lot of compromising in that city because of that water supply, those aqueducts. They did a lot of compromising. Jesus said, look, you need to walk by faith. You need to trust me. And the reason I say that is because of what Peter wrote, 1 Peter 1, 7. He says this, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, it might be found under the praise, the honor, and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You need to walk by faith. 
That's the idea behind this. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Follow me. Trust me. Let, let me show you what I can do in your life if you are willing to step away from the, all the pull and all the lore of the world. Step away from that. Let me show you what I can do. The second thing was white raiment. Watch the verse again. I counsel thee to buy of me gold trodden in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment. Remember, they had the, uh, they had the black glossy wool this, I think, is a call to get busy serving because they weren't. Remember, I told you, no persecution, no service. Here's why I say that. Watch Revelation 19.8. It says this, and to her, that's the church here. Uh, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen. Watch this. Is the righteousness of saints... I don't want to go too far into that. There is a connection with our service here and how we will be arrayed when we return with the Lord, how we, how we will be clothed. There is a connection here. That's what that says. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And so here in verse 18, whenever he says, I counsel thee to, to buy of me gold trodden in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. I, I believe it's a call to service. It's a call to service. Then the, the third thing is the I say, I've watched verse 18 again, I counsel thee to buy of me gold trodden in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with I say that thou mayest see. The result, if they were to walk by faith and they were to get busy serving, I think the result would be this, if they got back to the fundamentals, that what would happen was that their eyes would be opened and they would realize just how far they had drifted away, just where they were truly at. They couldn't see that right now. They were blind to that. They thought they were okay when they weren't. You know, that's where a lot of people are today. A lot of people are the same way. Let me ask you, what, what about you? Let me, let me just pick your mind for a second, then I'll get you down to a conclusion here. How's your dedication? How's your Bible reading? How consistent is your prayer life that's pretty good barometers as to where you're at those two things right there your bible reading and your prayer life will pretty much tell where you're at in your walk you know i don't know your lives i don't but i'm sure somebody here today fits into this text where you 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 you're living for the world you're saved, but you're living for the world. And so therefore, on the inside, you are, you are wretched and you are miserable and you are poor and you are blind and you are naked, spiritually speaking, because you're living completely for the world. The offer, watch it now, verses 19 and 20. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. I love that. Because you know what that tells me? No matter how far you've drifted away, no matter how deep you've gotten into the world, there is a door of repentance that is open to you. You can come back to where you need to be. Don't miss, I think, the warning in there, too. God loves you, and if he loves you, you stay where you're at. You'll be chastened. You'd be chasing. Watch verse 20. Here you got his heart exposed. Watch this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, let me just say this. I want you to listen to me. A lot of people want to use that for salvation. That has nothing to do with salvation. You know, I've, I've heard it used like that before. Look, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart knocking, and he wants to come in if you will accept him as your Savior. Listen, these people are already saved. This has nothing to do with salvation. This is the church, the body of believers. You say, then what's it got to do with? It has everything to do with fellowship. This church, because of the wealth of the world, pushed Jesus out. 
and he's on the outside and, and he wants to come in and he wants to bless them and, and he wants to have fellowship with them. And I say this, that I don't know where you're at in your life, but if, if he's not a part of it, he, and he wants to be, he longs to be. He wants to give you and, and, and see you enjoy the very best that he can give to you, all the blessings that he has, not material, spiritual blessings. He wants to bless you, but he can't. If you're all wrapped up in the world, he can't do it. And so therefore, he's standing at your heart's door knocking, saying, open up. Let me come in. Get the world out. Get it out. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get you down uh, to this, and then I think I have time to go back to 2 Kings 2. I want to go back there and read something for you. But in Job 22, 21 through 26, watch this. Job, this is written, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt, love, shalt, thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto God. Second Kings chapter 2. I, I was coming over today on the way over, and uh, I was listening to a pastor and and he was talking and he referenced second kings chapter two and i'm going to show you something come to verse uh verse one okay real quick so what you have here in this text is a picture of what we need to be like okay uh so examine your life in these verses that i'm going to read for you so in, in this text, Elijah is about to go away. He's about to be caught up in a whirlwind. And he's got, a, he's got, a, uh, he's got another prophet with him that is going to take over whenever he's gone. His name is Elisha. And as they walk, he's going he's gonna to encourage Elisha just to drop off and stay back. Just, just stay back. Watch verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. Now watch this. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Stop for a moment. He said, You stay back. He said, Not a chance. I am not going to quit. I am not going to give up. I'm going to walk with you. God is with you. I'm going to walk with you. I am not going to quit. I'm going to endure whatever I have to endure to get through this. Watch this. Verse uh, 4. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Again, he says, Elijah, why don't you just drop off? Why don't you just stay back? Elisha says, Not a chance, Elijah. Not a chance. I want to go with you. I want to serve the Lord. I want to go with you. Jump on down to uh, verse 9. No, let me go back. Uh, verse 7. Watch this verse. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together, smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were going over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, watch this, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Stop. I told you, Elisha is a picture of what we need to be like. 
There wasn't, nobody's going to discourage you, going to discourage him from following the Lord and serving the Lord. Nobody's going to discourage him. Even Elijah said, why don't you just tarry here? Stay back here. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go with you. Then they cross over the Jordan and he, Elijah turns to him and says, what can I do for you? He said, I'll tell you what you can do for me. I want a double portion of what you got. I want, I want everything that has been, that you've been blessed with and I want it double. Do you know what that means? That means uh, double the pressure in life, double the problems that you got to deal with, uh, double the sleepless nights, and, and that list could go on and on and on. But he said, I want double. I'm not satisfied with what I have. And, and Elisha goes on, and we studied his life here on Sunday nights several years back, and, and that's a very interesting study. But I, I want to say this to you. Where are you in your walk? What's going on in your life? Let me, let me borrow from Dobson, if I could, and, and ask you this question. How tough are you spiritually? Are you willing to endure the the struggles and the and the trials instead of quitting are you, do you want to grow or you I'll, I'll go back to elisha now are you like elisha and the fact that there's nothing that's going to deter you you want you want a double you want double whatever you can get this lord this is what i want i want to know you twice as much as what i know you now i want to i want to walk twice as close as what i'm walking with you now is that your desire that's what's needed. We, Revelation chapter 3 and the verses that we went through, the church of Laodicea describes the church in the latter days. But you don't have to be a part of it. That's by choice. That's by choice. God put it there for us to read and to back up and say, you know what, that's not going to happen to me. That's not going to happen to me. I am not going to be part of the status quo in the church, and I'm not going to continue down that path. I am going to stand up. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to stand for the truth of God's Word. I'm going to serve Him. I'm going to, I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to get involved because I want to be spiritually rich because the stuff here is going to go away someday. It's all going to go away, and you're not going to take anything with you. I did a funeral this week for a guy and i'll tell you one thing there was not a u-haul following the hearse to the graveside everything he had stayed back here same with you too same with you so just a challenge for you because i get concerned for people I get concerned because I want to see you blessed and I want to see the church grow spiritually stronger. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm not, that's, listen, that's fine if that happens. But give me, give me 50 people that are dedicated to the Lord as compared to a church of 200 people that are shallow and the 50 are going to accomplish far more than the 200. I can assure you. That's what we need. Deep believers today. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, uh, we, we only scratched the surface with the church of Laodicea. We only scratched the surface. But Lord, what, a, what a, uh, a passage of Scripture to use as a mirror to look into our own lives. And then to go back to 2 Kings and look at Elisha and see that, that, that he was willing to deal with whatever he had to deal with. He was willing to take a double portion that's what he desired. Lord, might that be our hearts? Might it be our hearts? So we want a double portion of you, Lord, a double portion to draw closer to you, to serve you, to be careful as to not to compromise, to stay separated from the world, to keep it away. Lord, we got to be in it because we live here, but we don't have to be a part of it. That church at Laodicea, Lord, you couldn't tell the difference in them and everybody else. That's why there wasn't any persecution. Lord, might that never be said about us. So take the message and use it, I pray, for your honor and your glory. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.